everyone. Today we're going to be looking at our second text now. Um, so if you can get your anthologies, we're going to be looking at the Jessica Reed text. So um, it is this one. So experience, I survived an earthquake while scuba diving. So if you can just make sure you've got your anthologies. It is the first hand account. It was in the Guardian Weekend magazine. Um, it was about the earthquake in 2013 in the Philippines and Jessica Reed was scuba diving at the time. So if you just pause and just read through the text this time, um, and then we'll go through Pam TC and the key analysis. Right, we'll start with the purpose then as per usual. So obviously it's offering her perspective of what happened. We'll call it a tragedy because a lot of people did die, but she was lucky and she survived because she was scuba diving at the time. Um, but it obviously is showing the power of nature and you'll see that as it goes on. Right. Gives her the opportunity to reflect on the fragility of life, because as we see as it goes on, it talks about how she made a different decision and went to the island where it was hit massively than she could have died. So it's about how fragile life is and how fortunate she is. And then finally, it is also talking about the beauty and adventure that comes with scuba diving. She's an experienced scuba diver, so she is also talking about how wonderful that can be. Right, we'll move on to the audience then. Um, I would say UK audience, the imagery is basically creating this backdrop of something that maybe most people aren't familiar with and the beauty of the Philippines and generally scuba diving. So to us, it creates this nice image to start with. It's a first hand account and it's quite reflective at times. You could argue that the audience is also just, you know, it's for herself. And um, it was quite a cathartic thing maybe for her to write because she was in such a dangerous situation. And obviously then the most, you know, the obvious one. So followers, readers of The Guardian, Weekend Magazine or those that, you know, use that website because it is also published online. Right, mode then, so the text type. So as I've said, it is a first-hand account of Reed's experience. Um, it was published, first of all, in the Guardian Weekend magazine, but obviously, as you can see from the, the text, it is online, because you can see the hyperlinks, etc. And again, just to reiterate what I said um, with the other text, the other report, so reportage is obviously its opinion, it's the impressions of that person, but it also blends some facts in, so you can see that as the text goes on, where she starts using statistics. Right, topicality, pretty simple. So she starts off talking about, you know, the serenity, the calmness that comes with scuba diving um, and how beautiful it is. She basically just sets that scene to start with. Then she talks through sensory language about the actual experience of, you know, experiencing this earthquake whilst being submerged underwater, which is something that I can't imagine many people have experienced. So she talks through that and the fear she felt. And then as we get to the end, she just start to embed some figures about, you know, those that were on land and um, those that died and the kind of aftermath of that as well. And then finally, context quite a bit. Um, but we know just from the text itself that she's an experienced diver, so she's not new to this. Um, she's amassed loads of years of experience of doing this. It occurred on a diving holiday for her in the Philippines in 2013. And the earthquake she's talking about took place on the 15th of October, 7.2 on the Richter scale, which is very high. Um, and the epicentre was on the island of, by well, the island province of Bahal. So again, she was 30 minutes from that. So the epicentre was like the centre of where kind of the earthquake began. So very, very kind of, she's very close to it. As for the aftermath of it, so you can kind of understand the severity of it, 1.2 million people were affected, over 200 died, um, 976 were injured. Basically, it was just a, a huge earthquake that she experienced. And then on top of that for this area, Typhoon Haiyan, um, only a month later, um, also struck. So this area had suffered a lot during this time. Right, so we're going to start our analysis. So just as before, make sure you've got your highlighters. So we'll pick out the evidence. We'll then label the terminology. Um, and then obviously we'll do our analysis. There is quite a bit, so you might need extra paper, post-it notes, etc. Um, 
but it's a, it's a pretty simple text. Right, we'll start then, obviously at the start then, so we've got um, the obvious heading here, obviously a common convention for these text types. Straight away though, it's, you know, it's I survived, so you've got that first person pronoun, so it's her first hand account, um, but obviously then the past tense verb survived, straight away in the heading shows that, you know, her life was in danger, you wouldn't say that if it wasn't. Also the topicality, you know, an earthquake while scuba diving, this isn't something you read about every day. Um, it's quite a surreal experience, so it'll be quite enticing for the audience. It really kind of gets them in from the start. So obviously she's been scuba diving for 15 years and then she starts with the calmness and why she does it. She does this because it's so calm and beautiful. Um, but obviously we know this isn't the case in this text. Got a nice tridic structure. So I love the calmness, the hypnotic sound, the quiet clicks. So this nice tridic structure. It's very serene, it's quite calm, the sound of it all is quite beauty, beautiful. You've then got, you know, your terms hypnotic, calmness, quiet, nice magic feel there. It's very relaxing, very soothing and peaceful. So this is how it's starting, just like her experience. Right, we then move on. So now she starts talking. It's very like a narrative structure. It's like she's telling a story, which is very common for reports. So it was a Sunday morning and after breakfast, we boarded the boat with other advanced divers. It was a 40th dive. So just contextualising that she's, you know, she's she's not new to this and that how much she loves it. So it's narrative, quite trivial language. You no, know, it's after breakfast. It's all quite mundane, something very normal. So obviously it's preceding the chaos that's about to happen shows her confidence and how she could never have anticipated what was going to happen here. Then go on, we've got more imagery happening here. You've got luminous corals, etc. So you've got alliteration, adjectival phrasing, very descriptive as she's trying to set the scene of how beautiful, you know, scuba diving usually is. Foregrounding her love for scuba diving, sights it offers. And again, so there's the alliteration, you know, the repetition of the owl sound there, it's quite soft and it's quite tranquil. OK, we then have um, the beginning of the chaos, really, don't we? So it's after 45 minutes of diving, you've got the low rumble, like an engine. So she starts, something's not right here. You've also got the pun, you know, she, she was drowned out by this low rumble. because obviously drowned links the imagery of swimming and diving, etc. So it shifts the tone to one of danger, so, you know, drowned out, rumble. This is very unfamiliar for her. You've got rumble as well, which is onomatopoeia. You know, it's quite, you know, it's quite aggressive sound. It disturbs the beauty she's just been describing in the paragraph before. So here you've got a nice shift in voice and tone. Then she talks about the reaction of her diving structure. So when this is happening, the diving structure's eyes were wide with confusion and he didn't know what was going on. So you've got your idiom, eyes were wide. You know, if it's like terror that comes with that nice image there. Um, it's quite, you know, terrifying for the fact that her instructor, instructor, sorry, is confused. It shows how this just wasn't expected. It's going to provoke panic from her, the fact that he looks confused. So again, she's trying to maybe get across that feeling of, you know, the terror and shock that she was feeling when all of this started to happen. Right. We then have, so it's still in the same paragraph, so her mind goes towards her friend that she went on this holiday with and she couldn't see a friend, so you've got your nice noun friend there. Um, it's quite emotive, she's obviously desperate to kind of reunite with a friend, check that they're okay, building that tension, and it's just not calm anymore. So their experience has kind of been ruined here. And then, quite nice to end with on this paragraph, so you've got your nice declarative there. So the situation felt sinister and dangerous. Could argue it's sibilance as well. So this tone, it's went from using this alliteration of the L sound to the S sound. It's a bit more aggressive. It's that fear in her voice. She's quite, you know, she's bewildered by all of this. You can talk about um, the fact she says situation as well. It's quite ambiguous. She's, she doesn't know what's happening at this point. So again, it's that kind of chaos and the, the kind of fear that she's experiencing. It's a situation. She doesn't know what's going on. Right, we then move on to the next paragraph. 
So she starts, starts talking about um, being enveloped by clouds of white sand that mushroomed around her. She starts questioning whether it be underwater bomb. So now on top of obviously like the rumbling, the environment is now being disturbed because we talked about how serene it was before. Now the environment is completely shifting. So if we go to where it talks about clouds of white and mushrooms, that is a categoric reference to a reference in uh, Hiroshima later on, um, which I think we've talked about in the other video. You know, the, it's very infamous kind of bomb, had that mushroom shape. It's very daunting. It's terrifying. Um, and then it ends with the rhetorical question as well. So I've got quite a bit of um, notes for you to get down there. Um, but the fact that these clouds of white were enveloped, you know, it shows that her vision has been obscured. She can't see what's going on. And then you end with that rhetorical question. It's just all these thoughts going through her mind. She's thinking, is it an underwater bomb? Is that possible? Um, because she wouldn't naturally think, that, oh, OK, this is an earthquake. It's not something most people would understand. On top of that, I haven't highlighted it, but then you've got your nice um, reference to the giant turtle racing past. So you can talk about that being slightly, maybe a bit comical, the fact that there's this turtle, which are known to be slow racing past, basically just showing the chaos there, and the fact that even a turtle is racing away. So it's very odd. It's kind of creating that panic. So she must be feeling it too. Then talks about the vibrations again. She could feel it in her bones. The sound turned into a deafening roar. It's a nice sensory language there. It's what she can feel. It's what she can hear. It's all encompassing. It's a nice figurative language as well. It's just how powerful it was. Her body, you know, was was struck by fear, but obviously could physically feel this earthquake as well. And again, it's juxtaposing all the serene images that came at the start. Um, it's not what you'd associate with diving either, it's talking about a deafening roar. You think of being underwater as being quite quiet, etc. So again, this is so unusual. Okay, moving on then. So she starts talking about these waterfalls, sand, um, the floor, the seabed, etc. It's all basically below where it's starting to crack. Um, sand is being sucked down below her feet, so that's quite intimidating. It's a complex sentence as well. It's maybe creating that sense of breathlessness as well. It's like, what is happening? One thing after the other that she's seeing, and it's all maybe so sudden and quick for her. She's quite helpless in this situation too, because what can she do? Um, and then you've got where it talks about that's when I realised it's that kind of nice shift again there of tone and voice. It's like it struck her the severity of what is actually happening. Then talks about the noise of what it actually was, what she can hear. And it's the earth splintering open and grinding against itself. So the personification of the earth there is quite monstrous. It's very destructive. You've got the suffix ing being repeated, so splintering grinding it's that aggressive noise it's quite a grating sh um, sound that she can hear so she then talks about how this only um these this experience the sound the vibrations only lasted only two or three minutes um although it felt like longer so you've got your comparative longer but in the scheme of things where she says only two or three minutes, I think even for a reader, that is a long time to be submerged underwater, um, shaking, loud noises, etc. So again, it's very chaotic. Um, and then obviously comparative longer shows that basically in her mind it, it went on forever and how terrified she must have been. Then starts talking about how uneasily, um, after it kind of ceased, she followed the dive master through the plumes of sand. So everything had kind of subsided now. And uneasily, you know, she she's still anxious. She doesn't know if it's going to happen again. She doesn't know if, if this is over yet. So she's quite un uncertain about what's going on. So she could still be in danger. And do notice that now she calls him the dive master, not the dive instructor. So it's kind of like her fate lies in his hands. He is now the master. So again, just that movement there is quite interesting. So her fate is in his hands. Right. Um, she then talk about the, so this is happening and how much willpower it took for her just not to, to kind of swim to the surface as quick as she could. Um, so abstract noun willpower 
it's basically about her own battle with you no know, fight or flight. So she wants just to go back to the surface, but they need to find the others. So it's kind of like this internal battle, this struggle that she's had to overcome herself. So you talk about a voice of strength here, overcoming this obstacle, etc. But then she does see um, the group and a friend, etc., about 20 metres away. They're all holding hands and stopping for three minutes to stop decompression sickness. So it's a bit technical here. It's maybe, you know, that kind of language for scuba divers. Um, but if you don't do that, if you don't um, decompress, etc., it could be fatal. But it's that imagery again, fatal, that adjective. It's like they're still in danger. It's adding to that semantic field of death, that they're at risk, but they've got to remain calm. Um, so again, it's that battle they had to go through. They couldn't just panic and go back to the surface. Right, um, so we then have the, the proper reunion with her friend. So it was a huge relief to see my friend. So you've got adjectival phrase again, so a huge relief. It's eas easing the tension slightly here because they've now been reunited. So you can talk about that in a voice. And then they do surface, they pull off their breathing apparatus and shout, what was that? So this is the, the first bit of dialogue. You have to remember they've been underwater. So it's quite important she puts this dialogue in because it's the first thing they could actually say and how they could, you know, verbally communicate for the first time. And that's what they were worried about. What was actually just happened here? So she embeds this specific dialogue, um, reiterates how everyone was confused, everyone was distressed, and just the panic that they want to know what has just happened to them. OK, so they're now back on the boat, they're away from the water, and they're trying to find out what has actually happened. So they check the news and then the realisation hits that it was an earthquake. So high on the Richter scale um, and more energy than 30 Hiroshima bombs. So again, that's your anaphoric reference back to what I was saying before, where it talks about the mushroom clouds, etc. But she puts in this 7.2, 30 Hiroshima bombs, etc. It's very referential. It allows the reader to understand the, the kind of lengths of what, you know, the, the severity of it. And also she embeds facts, um, which again is very common for reports. So remember, it's always a kind of opinion, but surrounded by some facts because that is the job of a report. So she's reliving this moment, it's very daunting and it allows us to understand because 7.2 on a Richter scale might not mean anything to us, but comparing it to Hiroshima it makes things a bit clearer. So she talks about after that, so high on adrenaline, so she knows she's buzzing from this situation, so she's lucky um, that she's alive, but then she starts thinking about, oh actually this is an experience that many people won't be able to experience, you know, she's seen nature at its most stunning and most ferocious. So you've got your juxtaposition there between stunning and ferocious um, and also superlative. Most has been repeated, most stunning, most ferocious. It's like the extreme sight she's witnessed, this unusual, surreal experience. But it's also talking about how powerful nature can be. But again, it's kind of like she's in awe of it at the minute. It's, it's slightly positive language, but that doesn't last long. So they finally come to the realisation of what has happened. So I think they just think about themselves at that point, how lucky they were to experience it. But then they start to realise actually how dangerous it could have been for them and the effects it's had on, I think it's a bow hole. So if we go to where it says more than 200 people have died with 1,000 injured. So you've got your statistics there. Again, coming for a report. Um, it's this excitement about how stunning it was, you know, it's, it's very short lived, it's quite sobering. She realises the number of fatalities and how, you know, destructive it was um, and, yeah, the extent of it. 200 people dying, etc. is a large number. Then we move on after that. So she's trying to come to grips with things. So it's that quite cathartic experience for her. She has to realise actually what's happened here and how lucky she is. And then it says they spent the night on the boat drinking lots of very strong Philippine rum. I think it's a bit humorous, light humour, that's what they had to resort to. In shock, she's just trying to process what's happened. And then we, we come to the end here. So she talks about how nearly everyone that died was on the island of Bohol, which is only 30 minutes away. 
Um, so if we just go to that proper noun there, again, come for rapport, it's, inf you know, it's information people need. But the fact that it's also 30 minutes away just shows how close she was. It's quite somber voice here, very reflective, and she's never going to be forgetting this experience. So how close she was to the actual main scene of destruction and death. Then she talks about, it's a bit of a reflective piece here. So she's talking about that morning she made the decision to go diving instead of going to the hospital on Bohol, this island, which was, you know, hit severely because she had an earache. So she's going to go to the hospital there, but she didn't. So she decided to go for a dive. And then it ends with, had I gone, I would have arrived as the earthquake hit. So you've got that modal verb would. So it's shown the certainty of what, you know, that would have happened. She'd have been amongst the chaos on a bigger scale. So in the scheme of things, I guess you could say she was safe underwater. It's quite bleak. It's this final admission here, you know, how fragile life is. That one decision to go dive in could have actually saved her life um, or she could have suffered this tragic fate. So it's quite a, a sombre, sobering kind of final admission, a voice that ends with one of just kind of disbelief of how lucky she is to have survived. Right, so that is your analysis. So just moving forward then, Obviously, go through, make sure you've got all your key notes down. Obviously, there's many other things you could talk about. I couldn't do all the imagery, um, but there's loads you can talk about here. And when you consider this as a text, you know, we're looking at a question, you'd be comparing it to maybe something else of a natural disaster and the voice she creates when talking about such a kind of horrifying experience.